Hello and welcome to the UK Bundesliga. This is the first video on the channel and I'm honoured to be joined by a guest as a master over 17,000 subscribers on YouTube and 8,000 uh, Twitter followers as well for his opinions on the US men's national team. He is known as tactical manager, but luckily I'm enough to call him Filippo. Hello, how are you? Hi, hi yeah, please, by the name too, by the <laughs> name. But yeah, um, thank you very much for having me. No, it's, it's an absolute honour because uh, you look at US men's national team coverage and you started your channel now uh, from your oldest video. It was like over a year ago. Um, did you spot it's a, Did you spot a gap in the market for like US men's national team honest coverage from the fans rather than through, you know, the, the media itself? A little bit, but but ideally when I started, what, what we wanted to do for the channel was cover the United States, South America, cover everything, right? Be very broad um, in English. And I didn't think the market was lacking in that sense. It's just something I wanted to talk about. <laughs> but as we were doing the videos, um, every time we would do United States videos, we did like a one about the World Cup. We did about Giovanni Reina, Chris Richards, and we started the American Abroad. The views of the United States are always much higher. There was more interest. That's when we noticed, yeah, maybe maybe this U.S. market, yeah, there is people wanting content like this and the media or other YouTube channels are not attending that right now or meeting their expectations. So we started to go all in into that. Um, I actually thought in the beginning I didn't want to cover just the United States because I thought I thought there weren't enough people that cared about it. So I was like, <laughs> let's cover United States, South America. I'm also Brazilian American, so I watched the Brazilian national team very closely. Yeah. Um, so I was like, let's cover everything. And Dustin works with me in the channel, right? He does all the the arts and editing, producing everything. So yeah, at one point, yes, we noticed that maybe uh, the coverage was lacking. But the first yeah. goal was to cover a lot of soccer, including the U.S. and and then eventually just like, all right, people want this. Uh, we love doing it. Let's go all in on the United States and see what, see how it goes. And it's been going well. Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been going well if you think over 17,000 subscribers in that time. And I will say, do you think that is a bit of a reflection of soccer slash football in, in the US as a whole and how much it has grown in in recent years to what it used to be? For sure. Um, for sure. The growth of US soccer plays a role on the growth of our channel. Uh MLS has been growing here in terms of popularity. New franchises are coming. So every time there's a new franchise in MLS, for any of the international viewers that you have that don't know, uh, they expand into a new city. When they come into a new city, obviously that draws interest from people that might have never watched soccer before or football, and they'll just come into it. So the growth of U.S. soccer plays a role for sure um, on the growth of the channel. The A lot of Americans playing in big leagues now are drawing interest because – MLS is not the most watched league in the United States, right? It's Liga MX um, from Mexico and then probably Premier League, Bundesliga, then MLS comes along. So for a lot of the American fans seeing um, the Christian Pulisic, Weston McKinney, Tyler Adams, Giovanni Reynas emerge, it, it, it draws more of people's interest. So that's most certainly playing a role. Plus two trophies last year. I know it's CONCACAF, but you can only beat what's in front of you. And for us, it was what we could beat. We got two trophies. And hopefully next month, we're recording this in February, we qualify the World Cup and put 2018 past us. And from now on, consistently make it, right? We don't have to deal with that again, hopefully. Yeah, I don't want to reflect on it, but uh, was that probably the lowest, one of the lowest points for, for, for US uh, soccer in recent memory for you? Uh, from my lifetime, yes. Yeah. Because, um, so I lived in Brazil, lived in the US, um, the U.S. has always qualified to World Cup since 1994, right? I mean, 94, 98, 2000. We haven't had good runs, like 2002 quarterfinals, um, 2014, that Belgium, historic Belgium game that we lost, unfortunately. But it's it's it seemed like since 94, U.S. soccer was on an upward trajectory constantly. But 2018 seemed like we just took steps back, right? Not qualifying in CONCACAF. Uh, so... That was that's definitely been the lowest point in U.S. soccer um, from at least 1994, right? At least. Maybe you can yeah. even go deeper because, I mean, if you go to like the 30s or I think 1950, the U.S. finished third in a World Cup. Um, so, yeah, in recent history, that has to be low because after 1994 and after the success, we even did well in the 1994 World Cup, right? Losing to Brazil, the champions 1-0 only at a 4th of July, by the way. Um, <laughs> 
but but yeah it's um it has to be the lowest right it was unexpected because after that time i think not even international soccer fans expected the u.s to ever miss a world cup looking into Concacaf, right it's not the strongest confederation they're like oh it's always going to be u.s and mexico and a couple will follow along and then when the u.s didn't make it and panama did it was a shocker to the world well, not a shocker the world was like laughing at us but for us it was just like in the combination of results that had to happen yeah. along with us losing to trinidad <laughs> we're just crazy and it, it all happened and a lot of the goals happened at the end of the game it was just it was it was a little not a little it was a disaster <laughs> Yeah, and, and as you say, you've had games in the past. I remember, I will say on the record, that Belgium versus USA game is my favourite game of all time. Uh, Tim Howard, really? uh, I don't know what he turned into in that game, but uh, I know w- one Wikipedia changed him to the US Secretary of Defence on, on Wikipedia <laughs> for some reason it, during that game. But as you say about how the US men's national team have prepared, do you think that result was like a much-needed hard reset if, if, if that makes any sort of sense, you know, like t- take a look at yourselves and you need to go in a different direction or just changes. I think yes, but I don't think anything has changed. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't think our federation has changed. I think the same problems are there. The only difference is this generation is much more talented than that one that had the, t- the 2018 World Cup qualifying cycle, right? Just like before, the problems were always there, but before they had, Lyndon Donovan, Clint Dempsey, um, many different other players. Jermaine Jones was still in his... There are many players that you can go back and talk about. Brian McBride, blah, 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 um, that were able... They're they're just too good for CONCACAF. They were able to pull through it and qualify. I think we qualified in first twice in a row or or two of the three cycles we qualified in first. So, yeah, I think it was just that. That generation was bad and the Federation (laughs) is still bad. This generation is just better. I don't think the Federation has improved. So... Was it a wake-up call? I think it was more of a wake-up call to the fans. The fans are now much more vocal than ever before, um, sometimes complaining too much, even though I don't think complaining is ever a problem as long as you don't take it to, like, violence and things like that um, or personal attacks. As long as you're complaining about what's going on in terms of the game and the federation, it's fine. And I think fans are much more vocal about it and much more aware. And, and that's even one of the reasons why I think people even care about my channel, right? If if because I'm very vocal about things and if the American fans didn't want to deal with that I wouldn't have any interest in the channel people wouldn't care about me so I think it was more of a wake-up call to the fans mm. more than the federation the, the the stupid things that the federation does it, it's still there I'm not going to dive into it in this video you don't need this type of negativity in here no, no. but it's still the same nonsense it's all right, because there's something I'm going to bring up in a bit about a certain game that happened very recently. It seemed a little bit nonsensical on where it was played, but we'll go, We'll reflect on the the um, the last international break as a whole. Of course, we're our Bundesliga-based channel. If people don't know, you know, the likes of Ricardo Pepe got called up, and I'm going to ask you about team selection a little bit, if that's okay with you. But how would you reflect on these past qualifiers as a whole? You know, you, you did beat El Salvador, you did beat Honduras, but then that game in the middle against Canada unfortunately you fell to a 2-0 defeat but as Greg says you dominated the ball um so uh <laughs> but how would you reflect on a whole well I guess Greg Berhalter wants us to be the World Cup champions of ball possession right it's like <laughs> yeah we want it's like yeah we we didn't dominate Canada it's just complete nonsense to say that right um they had better goal scoring opportunities than we did uh, the only thing they did was th- they had less possession. That's literally all. They were more dangerous when they had the ball. They were much more effective, and they scored twice, and we scored none. So what are you going to say yeah. about it? Uh, that's not a dominant performance in my books. Um, we beat El Salvador. We beat Honduras. I thought it wasn't a good camp because mm. we needed to get that seven points because now we're arriving the last camp in a semi-comfortable situation. Our window's a little bit complicated. The, the matchups are complicated. We're still four points into the top three, so we should be fine um, to yeah. qualify. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't a good camp. We didn't play well against El Salvador. It was a 1-0 scrappy win. We, we Yeah, w- that game we actually did control El Salvador. Um, yeah. we, were, we didn't give them chances, and we had a few. But it was still a grind out 1-0 win, which should have been maybe a 2-3-0 win at home, comfortable. Mm-hmm. Honduras, yeah, we beat them 3-0, but Honduras is the worst team in World Cup qualifying. They haven't won a game. And we also tried to freeze them in the game. Like, we literally tried yeah. to freeze. No, like, not, not, I'm not joking. It's not like we tried to, like, oh, we no. put them. No, no. 
we literally tried to put him in a freezer and some players from Honduras got hypothermia in the game. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was going to say that you successfully did it with the goalkeeper. I think, I think that poor man had to be re replaced at some point, but I, I, I will have to ask you about that game. What, what, the Canada one, you will, you, as you said, disappointing. But the Honduras game for me just seemed a little bit nonsensical as to why it was played in Minnesota in February. People don't know where Minnesota is. Very close to Canada, I would say. It's at the north of, uh, of the United States. And obviously, we do temperature a little bit different. We do degrees Celsius. You do degrees Fahrenheit. It was heavy into the minuses, I think maybe on both ends, actually. Um, but how, hmm. how would you reflect on, like, why that decision was made because there was a lot of controversy surrounding it. Um, first, it's embarrassing, right? That the United States at home has to like, we need to pick a specific location to defeat Honduras, right? Um, it's just a tiny soccer nation mentality, right? It's kind of ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, you're in England. If England is going to play San Marino in um, England, they're not going to yeah. go, oh, we need to play in Manchester because the weather conditions and the fans will be a little bit better. And I just threw Manchester out of nowhere. Okay. I don't, I, I I'm not That's trying where to I'm from. It's all right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's just kind of like the United States is going to play Honduras in the United States, put the game in a location where the players will be able to actually perform. Yeah, sure. It's winter here. So it's not going to be, it doesn't have to be in the warm. You don't have to play in Florida and keep it warm, but at least get somewhere where in Celsius degrees, it's like 10 degrees Celsius, over yeah. five at least, right? Uh, I believe, I don't know exactly in Celsius how much it was, but we were near zero Fahrenheit. I think it was something near like negative 15 Celsius. Um, <laughs> it wasn't comfortable for the players. Uh, even the American players, come. They in a, in a very nice way they complained about the decision after the game a lot of them were just saying i'm not playing here ever again what is going yeah. on some of them had like it was it was it was just embarrassing that the united states had to even consider that there was also that whole premises that berhalter the federation they try to avoid areas that there's more latinos or hispanics because they want to have home advantage they yeah. think there will be more and that has happened in the past when you face like costa rica i think it was in new york but again, this is embarrassing, right? You're playing in your country and you're still worried about the home crowd being the opposition. And <laughs> you're still trying to use like weather tricks because players from Central America won't be as used to an American player to the cold. It's just embarrassing that that still is an issue here from a country with the resources the United States has. And honestly, nowadays, when you compare to Honduras, the players we have, right? It's just... Yeah. It doesn't make sense to me. I was going to say, I definitely want to touch on the players because you do have, in my opinion, one of the most talented like youth teams. If you look at how the average age of your squad, it's much lower than it, than it, than it used to be. And we have spoke about the Bundesliga players and we'll definitely focus on them more. But I want to talk about a certain player that st starred in the final game against Honduras. He plays currently, um, he doesn't currently play in the Bundesliga, but I'd like to see him in the future. It's Della Torre, who impressed a lot of people. But he was never quite getting a chance do you think he's one of them that needs to be put into the future of this national team? So I, I do need to watch more of Luca De La Torre. Uh, I don't watch Eredivisi. I watched his game over the weekend against Ajax, and he didn't do well in that game. The United mm -hmm. States, he had limited opportunities, and the one he got now playing the full 90, they're starting, he grabbed it. He played very well against Honduras. But again, take it with a grain of salt. We had an opponent that was weaker and frozen at that point in, yeah <laughs> in, in, in. so so yeah i what i think it's our the main complaint of the fan base is not that we think de la torre is the future or the savior he's most certainly not a starter i'll tell you that yeah. from the players we have it's more about certain players that greg berhalter are is willing to give many caps and opportunities like christian roldan legit Ariola, these guys that play in mls their whole careers and um, or most of their careers in just don't cut it, right? And then a player like mm -hmm. De La Torre, which is performing well in the Eredivisie, uh, doesn't mean he's better than them. It just means that why doesn't he get the same opportunities? If you can give Roldan 30 caps, what does De La Torre have to do to get one? And he finally did get one, and he performed way better than Roldan has ever had. So our complaint is that, do we build around De La Torre? Absolutely not, right? Our mm -hmm. midfield has Tyler Adams from Leipzig, Weston McKinney, that's been very good for Juventus. 
Yunus Musa, that's an English American right now. He plays for the United States. He's in Valencia yeah. starting at age 19. Giovanni Reina, which is probably our highest ceiling player. Yeah. Uh, so no, you don't you don't you don't build around De La Torre, but he should be a rotational player and he needs to get more opportunities. He showed he's good on the ball. He can he can provide much more than a lot of these MLS guys that Greg Berhalter loves. Yeah. And another selection that confused a couple of the fan base is the, the relentless use of Gassi Zardes over uh, Ricardo Pepe. I think it was uh, the, the Canada game, which he didn't start in. And as a, a Bundesliga fan, and I did watch the MLS before he came to the Bundesliga, I'm a massive fan of Ricardo Pepe. I'm on the train, you could say. Um, <laughs> wh- why is it, do you think, that he sticks with these sorts of players? And, and Pepe, I think, has the most contributions in the qualifiers for you guys. Is it a case of rotation or is it a case of, you know, he's not ready for the, the big games? Or What do you think the reasoning is behind not using I think Pepe? it's just favoritism, favoritism yeah. from Greg. I mean, saying Pepe's not ready for the big games is crazy because Greg Berhalter started him in a game against Honduras back in September where technically his job was on the line. That was the mm-hmm. first window. And we had tied El Salvador, tied Canada. And if we didn't beat Honduras, he would have finished the first window three games with two or three points. Who knows? Maybe he would have got fired or or risky, at least. And he played Pepe and Pepe was involved in all four goals in that win, including scoring and assisting two, I believe, or assisting one, at least. Now, um, many might. Well, you might not know or maybe you don't remember. Greg Berhalter has coached Columbus crew and J- Jesse Zardes was his player there. And he still is. A, so there's favoritism. And even yeah. if you remove Zard- Pepe. There's other players that probably deserve an opportunity ahead of Zardes, like Pifak that plays at the Swiss League, Daryl yeah. DK that just moved to West Brom, um, even Sargent that's playing the Premier League, struggling mm-hmm. ups and downs, but probably a better option than Jassi Zardes. So I think it's just favoritism. And, and he's another player of that example. I talked about Rodan, Leggett, Ariola. Um, another example of Greg like persisting on certain players. God, there was like this player, Jackson Yule, that he persisted for so long. And it was just bad performance after bad performance. And everyone's like begging for a different guy. And it took him so long to not play that guy. And and now Legette is slowly moving out from from the New England Revolution. Yeah. It's just favoritism, in my opinion. Yeah, that, that, that's completely fair. And I do, I do want to ask you about, because you do have a lot of young, um, especially Bundesliga players. I think there's something like 10 Bundesliga teams have at least one American. And, you know, we talk about Chris Richards and stuff. And I do want to ask, is... Greg Bartler, in your opinion, the best person to mold these players and help them progress in their careers as the head coach of the US Men's National Team. I know it's obviously not your place to fire him or anything, but is he is yeah. he the best coach to progress these young players for the national team? I don't think so. Um, I think there's better options out there now. Yeah, we could replace him and turn out that the next coach is even worse, right? I, I, I'll say this. Um, Greg is probably not the guy to get this generation to reach their potential, right? Is someone, is the next guy going to be better than Greg? I don't know. Um, um, but he's not the guy to maximize his potential from what I've seen so far. And, and I do want to ask uh, for that. Um, what is the ceiling for this national team? Cause I look around the pitch and there is a, a amazing young players, uh, everywhere. I mean, you look in goal, obviously, Stefan and Turner rotating, but Slanina got his first chance this, uh, to be part of the camp this year. And you do have an incredible spine. Former Bundesliga man, Weston McKenney, is an absolute star. What is the ceiling for this team? I think if, if they reach their potential, all these players, I think in the World Cup that we're hosting in 2026, um, maybe we could see, maybe in form, we could see a semi-final run. I don't think this is a team that can actually compete for a World Cup title so far. Uh, winning a World Cup requires good management, um, form, world-class players, which we don't have world-class players right now. And if I looked at our team, I only see Giovanni Reina with a world-class potential. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we're not there yet. But but look, hosting, we've seen many different hosts of World Cups make deep runs with much weaker teams. So I think semi-final in like a 2026 World Cup, if the stars align, it's not that crazy of a take. No, I, I don't think so. And as you say, um, Giovanni Reina obviously returned this weekend uh, mm-hmm. uh, as a substitute. And probably one he'll forget in a 5-2 defeat to Leverkusen, but he, he is back. And I think a crucial thing, I don't know if you agree, is keeping him fit. It's trying to keep him healthy. 
Yeah, uh, this was also, I think, the first big injury I've seen Reyna have. So maybe it was just an injury, yeah. right? And he'll be back and fine. Pulisic worries me more in terms of injury than Giovanni Reyna because we've seen it being chronic almost. Reyna, mm. this was the first one. So hopefully he's fine. Hopefully he's that. What worries me maybe about Reyna was his dad, Claudio Reyna, that's a USMNT legend, did deal with a lot of like little injuries and he had a mm. I think it was a knee injury that was serious and then he had a lot of like little injuries. Let's hope Reina is built differently. Giovanni Reina is built differently. Yeah, hopefully the apple fell a bit further from the injury tree in that sense. And uh, yeah. obviously we're gonna finally move on to it now because I remember you did do a video because it is a it is a Bundesliga based YouTube channel. Uh, you did a video on your channel about why Americans move to the, the Bundesliga and it's a very interesting watch. You should go and find it. It's with a an expert on the Bundesliga. I'd say a bit better and an expert with me because he's German, so he probably knows a little bit more. Um, but you spoke in that video about why players move there. Is it to do with the, the language, the, the culture? Um, what do you think? Has anything changed on your opinion from then as to why? Are the players a bit more talented now, would you say, a year on? I think it's the same reasons as before. I don't know. If, I mean, I think there's more because there's what happens is as you get more Americans to be successful, the league will start trusting that market a little bit more. So they'll take a little bit more gambles with that, right? And since some Americans were successful there and have been and are, like Weston McKenney is one I can we can talk about that got sold the Juventus and the ones that are playing there now, I think Bundesliga clubs are more willing to take that risk. It's like, all right, so that league might not be as bad as it used to be. Uh, players are working out. Alfonso Davies came out of MLS. That's not an American, but it's still yeah. a world-class player that came out of that league. So I just think they're watching a little bit more and scouting MLS a little bit more, and they're noticing that they can find talent there. And like you said, a lot of the Americans have European passports, so that facilitates the transfer. Um, some of them have German passports, like Justin Che, I know he has it, and he's there in Hoffenheim right now. And yeah, culturally, I think it's easier for an American to adjust to like Germany than it would be maybe to Spain from a culture standpoint, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that's probably the main reason, one of the main, yeah. re one of the many reasons. Yeah, I, th I think I think you're probably right. But we saw this 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 January, like we saw um, the likes of as I mentioned, Pepe Pepe has moved. Justin Shea has moved. Uh, George Bello ha has moved. There was a kind of a mini American invasion coming over to the to the Bundesliga. And you're a man who, as you say, you probably watch a lot more MLS than the average person. For, from a, people who watch the Bundesliga perspective, maybe they've not seen as much uh, of these players. Um, how do you think they will fare? If you want to go individually, you can do. But as a, as a, as a whole, how much do you think the, the talent will fare in the Bundesliga? It's a little tricky, right? Uh, we've had a few that have been successful, like Weston. Um, Tyler is doing fine at Leipzig. Giovanni Reina has done well. Joe Scali from Borussia Mönchengladbach, and hopefully I said their name right. You are. I mean, yeah. he, he wasn't playing in MLS. He was in the bench of New York City FC. He arrives in, in Bundesliga, stays in the reserves for six months, and comes in this season. And I'm not going to say he's been balling out fantastic but he's held his own just fine um he's been reliable not a problem when they play him he does his thing and he's only 19 now so how will they translate i think each situation is different right it depends mm -hmm. on where you land the club you're at pepe has landed in a club that's fighting against relegation he's also mm -hmm. arriving there not at the best form he was in good form last season not the best form now I think Pepe will take time, but I think over time he should be fine. And and when you have a team like Bayern interested in you, and Bayern was interested in Pepe at one point, uh, it shows that you have some talent. Now, look, like Brazil, and look, Brazil's in a completely different level, but when you export many players abroad, you will have players that will just be busts and will come back to your league in the future. You'll have players that will be successful. What I like about the United States now is that we're sending a lot of players to these leagues. And many won't work out, but mm. we will have more than one or two or three that we had in the past. We'll have many more because we're sending so many, right? So individually, I, I don't know what to say. These guys are young, man. Um, Bello is 19, Pepe's 19, Skyly. They're all very young, the ones that got these transfers in. Anything can happen. All I'll say is not all of them will succeed. Yeah, and I think that's a fair point. And 
on the Joe Scully situation, not a player we really mentioned because he, he doesn't get called up to the men's national team, not as as of yet anyway. Um, but you, you do bring up that I remember the first game watching Brush and Munch and Gladbach when he played against Bayern Munich. That is a baptism. I don't if I don't know if fire is a bit generous for him because you have to play the best team in the Bundesliga and he really did hold his own. How long do you think he is away from being a fullback for the US men's national team? Because he, he's still young, but with Greg, who knows, right? <laughs> um, he's bringing he's bringing options that Scali should already be ahead of. But um, I, I'm gonna say I, I probably don't think Scali will be with the national team much this year at all, and, and probably won't be in the World Cup roster. And that's just what I think. Um, and then Greg might be gone after Qatar, and then after that, who knows? But I'm not very hopeful of having him in the squad. I would have him. I would have him. I think we do need him, but I don't. I, I I wouldn't put it past Greg to just not have him at all this year. Maybe in Nations League in June, which will be like preparation mm-hmm. for the World Cup. Maybe he'll bring some guys to test them out. But yeah. for qualify next window, I don't think he'll be there. And for the World Cup, I don't think he'll be there as well. As of now, yeah, unfortunately, of course, because he I think he has in his uh, kind of debut Bundesliga season been a real shining light for a poor Gladbach side. They were in the Champions League last year. And this year, they're hovering just above the relegation zone. So it is a real poor time for them. And, and you do bring up um, Pepe, who is in another struggling side in Augsburg. I saw some things on, on Twitter when he was linked with the likes of Wolfsburg and the likes of Bayern Munich. Um, people were against Wolfsburg because of Florian Kohfeldt and what he did to Josh Sargent, moving him from a striker to a winger. Did you ever have that same fear? Um, I joked about it, about maybe <laughs> him playing. But, but it's different, right? Pe- there's no... Pepe can't play as a winger. That's just not no. it. Sargent is a little bit more versatile. So I joked about it, but I, I never really thought he would. And, and he, I mean, there's been very limited games um, for Pepe at Augsburg right now, and he's just playing as a center forward. Uh, he didn't go to Wolfsburg. I don't think Ophelt would have done it. That's all I'm saying. I don't think he would have played him as a winger. I mean, I would hope. And also, um, Veghorst has left. And that was yeah. probably in the plans when they were negotiating with Pepe that Veghorst could leave. And that's their center forward. So I, I don't think yeah. he would have. They, they eventually replaced, uh, I think, with Jonas Wind from Copenhagen. So maybe that was their second choice if Pepe did decide to... Because mm-hmm. Augsburg kind of swooped in out of nowhere. I, I genuinely, when I was covering the transfer, it was like he's going to one of these big pedigree Bundesliga teams. And I checked my phone the next day and he's moved to Augsburg. And it was really just out of nowhere. I think it, it, people explained it a little bit. I don't care about that too much, so I didn't dive into it. But it had something to do with the American owner stepping in. And that's also why, to be honest, as much as I think Pepe's good, Augsburg did overpay to yeah. like kind of like snatch the deal, kidnap the deal that was pretty much set with Wolfsburg at that point. Yeah. And and I, I hope, I'm not going to, I might be putting you on the spot here, but the, the likes of who came over, the Justin Shea, the Kevin Paredes, who out of the transfers that were made do you think will have the best career? I know it's a bit of an on-the-spot question. There's a lot of unknowns. But who it, who do you think will be the most impressive? You mean of just Bund- Bundesliga? Yeah, uh, we'll stick to Bundesliga. I mean, it's, we'll have to stick to Bundesliga, yeah, unfortunately. But. Um, the transfers we had, we had Pepe, we had Bello, we had, um, I guess Shame. you can count Scali next. Um who would you say? Sorry. Justin Shane, Kevin Paredes as well, because Paredes Shane. did move to Wolfsburg in the end. So you, they did get the American. I am, I might be more, I think Justin Shea probably will have the best career. I think uh, yeah. center backs take longer to develop. So maybe the beginning of him right there, the start of him in Bundesliga will be a little bit shakier than these guys. Yeah. Pepe could start scoring out of nowhere. Um, Bello can start. But center backs take a little bit longer. And we're seeing that with Chris Richards, right? Didn't get many yeah. minutes. Now he's starting to play more and more and more and doing very well. Uh, che is a player that Germany even wants to bring into their youth system, right? Their youth national team. So I, I think if I had to bet money on someone, it would probably be Justin Che right now, even though I'm hopeful that all of them will, hopefully. No. But it's not easy. Yeah, of course. And I know you do a show on your channel about the uh, the Americans uh, across Europe. And is, is there anybody catching your eye from elsewhere? We'll move away from the Bundesliga. Is there anybody catching your eye? Well, uh, you say Pifok, uh, Jordan Siabacu, scored in the Champions League this year. In, uh, in Manchester United's group, and he's been incredible in the Swiss League. But is there, is there anybody catching your eye that could be due maybe a, a move elsewhere or just impressing you in general? Well, I think De La Torre, right? Uh, he's playing for uh, 
Heracles, which is an average, I would say, at a Divisi team, not in the top, probably not relegation either. So maybe he needs to move either to a better at a Divisi team or to a, a, a top five league where he'll have to like grind out a little bit more, play a little bit tougher opponents on a day on a weekly basis. I think the Torres one that needs a move. Um, there's many other players we can go into. I think Brendan Aronson maybe is ready for a bigger step right now. Brendan Aronson yeah. might be ready for a bigger step. Uh, he's outgrown the Austrian league, has performed in the Champions League. So maybe it's time for Brendan to move to a top five league and see what he can do with tougher opponents on a weekly basis as well. Yeah, and I do want to quickly ask, because you've just brought him up, Brendan Aronson. I want to say uh, uh, there's Paxton as well, who's, who's in the MLS. And people, some people have said that he might be uh, like better at his stage of his career than, than Brendan was at, at that age. Do you, do you agree with that sentiment? Do you think Paxton's one of them that we could see, in not not soon, but maybe after this MLS season, if he really does break out, that could move to, for example, the Bundesliga? Um, I, I don't know when he could move. He still needs to break out in MLS. He's had sparks of talent throughout the last season. Uh, we still need to see more. But yeah, he looks... It's not that he looks better than Brendan. I, I guess, yeah, at the age of... He looks better than Brendan on the ball. He looks like he's a yeah. more technical player. Um, creative, right? So that's what he looked better at finishing than Brendan was at that age. But Brendan brings some different things to the table, which are a lot in the mindset. We're going to have to see if Paxton has that same mindset that Brendan Aronson has. Uh, yeah, he looks to have a higher ceiling, mm -hmm. but soccer is not just about what you can do on the ball. There's other things that come into play in mentality and tactically and work rate, things that Brendan brings that we need to see that from Paxton. I haven't seen it yet. And he's still much yeah. younger. I think Paxton just turned 19 or he's still 18. Yeah. And the MLS does return in, uh, I think it's it's just under a month now. I think I think it is away. Um, from 26, Brendan. I believe, is the first uh, day of the games. 26 of February. Yeah. So it is, it's, oh, it's just under three weeks away now. And I know uh, you've mentioned you go into the Charlotte game. Uh, are you looking forward to that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, very much. It's supposed to be in the um, North Carolina Panthers game, the NFL uh, stadium, the, the mm -hmm. NFL team, which fits over 70,000 people. And apparently it's sold out. So that's going to be lots of fun. Yeah. That, that, and that is a, a big stadium. And that, uh, hopefully they win for you, of course, on that, uh, on that first day. But overall, would you say that the, the MLS this season – if you if you could pick a team to, to shock everyone, I know this is very early. Uh, who are you picking? Because we saw the the champions just this uh, this past year. Who are you going with? Dude, that's that's very tough to say right now. That is very tough to say right now because there's still transfers going on, and then during the all the way till the summer, there's more stuff that's gonna happen. Um, but if I want to put a safe bet, as always. <laughs> I have to go safe right now because there's many like I, I'm an Orlando City fan. Orlando City, they made some interesting signings, but I still think the team's about the same level as last year, which is not a MLS Cup winning team. Yeah. If I'm going to go safe, I'm just going to go with the Sounders um, if I'm going to oh. go safe. Right. They've they've had a good season last year without Jordan Morris and Jordan Morris is returning. They've kept all the players as far as I know. Uh, they have a good system. It works. I'm going to go with the Sounders, as and, easy of a pick as that sounds. And, and that's on the record now, so we will be coming back uh, next season <laughs> to talk through that. Um, when, uh, But overall, I will, final question, I promise, I'm keeping you for too long here. Um, on the new signings that are coming to the MLS, there's a few big names, and we're talking people in the prime still of the careers. We're talking Lorenzo Insigne to, to Ron, so we've just heard Shakiri's on the move. Um, I'm going to say past his prime, Carlos Tevez uh, is on the move as well. Um, how, who are you most excited to see? For me, it's Lorenzo Insigne because he is a star. Yeah, um, DeAndre Edlin also just returned. He's going to go play for Inter Miami. So, I mean, yeah, he's not like Insigne star, but no. for the United States, he's a pretty yeah. big name. Um, I would say probably Insigne is the one I'm, I'm the most excited for because we had Jovinko in the past there, right? Same team. And yeah. Jovinko looked like prime Messi in MLS at that point. <laughs> but um, I think Insigne is a better player than Jovinko was at the time, in my opinion, yeah. in his prime right yeah. now. But the league is also better than it was at that time, in my opinion. So I'm interested to see how he's going to look and how that will affect Toronto after they had a very poor season last year. 
yeah, they, they kind of, I'd say, underachieved. They, they they never really got going. I think they finished bottom of bottom of the conference. Was it in the end, or did they just finish? Second? Yeah, they didn't make the playoffs. They they were down there, right? They had Chris Armas, that's a Manchester United assistant right now. Didn't do well for a while as the coach. It was just yeah. a messy season. And Josie, and now they revamped it, right? Josie Altidore left. They kept some key players. They got Bob Bradley to coach a very successful American coach uh, in Sini that we can talk. I I don't know. Did, did they sign Bellotti? I, I remember there were rumors. I don't think it was confirmed yet, but maybe I, Bellotti will arrive. I don't know what's it, going on there. It, it hasn't yet, but I tell you, 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 you're peaking at like 2019 in Italy at this point. You're getting all the people back together. And... <laughs> You're trying to go for the Euros. Toronto is trying to go for the Euros. <laughs> That's what it is. So uh, Chiellini and Benucci will be in the MLS next year, confirmed today by us. Um, but I'd like to thank you for, for joining me today, Filippo. I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Is there anything you want to plug? Feel free to plug away. Um, no, just thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm happy with the growth of U.S. soccer. I'm happy that people are starting to, even internationally, right? You're in England right now, and people, are, many are trying to keep track of what's going to the United States. Um, Maybe we're still not taken as seriously as we would like, but I think we're being taken more seriously than ever. And people are starting to look It's like, okay, looks like the United States is at least a decent national team now. And MLS is slowly becoming a relevant league internationally. Nationally, obviously, it's our biggest league behind in front of USL. But no, that's all. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. You can catch uh, Filippo on Tactical Manager uh, TV. You can catch him on Twitter as well. I think it's at Tactical Manager. Is it on Twitter? It's um, Manager Tactical. I had to do a reverse because oh, someone uh, had taken Tactical Manager. Thank you for coming on the first video of the UK Bundesliga channel. I couldn't have started any better. Thank you very much.